Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt this conversation, but I'm delighted to be doing so because I get to, to introduce to you our, our luncheon entertainment. Uh, we are very <laughs> fortunate to have uh, Charlie Brower uh, agree to uh, submit himself to uh, questioning uh, and to submit himself to a conversation with his son, Chip. Uh, no one could be more qualified to engage in uh, this activity. Uh, this is part of the uh, ITA's oral history project where we, uh, under the leadership of the Academic Council, we are attempting to capture the stories, the histories uh, of the most uh, eminent arbitrators uh, in the world. And we are very pleased to have uh, Charlie agree to uh, be part of our series. Um, I'll introduce them each to you very, very briefly. Uh, Charlie Brower, of course, is a judge on the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. He's a member of 20 Essex Street Chambers, uh, and he's a former legal advisor at the State Department, former deputy special counselor uh, to the U.S. president, former partner at White & Case, former, uh, he was president of ASIL, he's been chair of ITA's advisory board, and he's the recipient of numerous honors, including ITA's Pat Murphy Award, ASIL's Manly O. Hudson Medal, and Berkeley Law's Stephen A. Riesenfeld Award. Um, his son, Chip, uh, who will uh, pose questions uh, to his father today, is a professor at Wayne State uh, University in Detroit and is also of counsel at Miller Canfield. Uh, Chip has 15 years of teaching experience. Uh, prior to moving to Wayne State, he was the Croft Professor of International Law at the University of Mississippi. He, too, is an arbitrator and has experience as counsel, including representing Costa Rica in front of the International Court of Justice. He is a vice chair of the Institute for Transnational Arbitration. He's a director of the Atlanta International Arbitration Society, uh, and he is the winner of the Smith Lowenfeld Award for best uh, article in published in arbitration uh, in 2012. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Charlie and to Chip. So um, many of you had the pleasure of hearing Toby Landau give a luncheon address at the ITA workshop a couple years ago in which he recounted testifying as an expert on the New York Convention in a Pakistani court. On cross-examination, counsel did not seem able to the task, did not seem to know much about the New York Convention, did not seem to know much about arbitration, in Toby's considered view, did not seem to know much about the law at all, but compensated for all that by treating Toby like a murder suspect. <clears throat> not finding that approach to be particularly helpful, the judge, in a master stroke, stopped the examination and instructed Toby to examine himself, after which he administered and countered the deftest cross-examination of an English QC ever seen in the Lahore High Court. So when invited uh, to join this pairing, I joked that it uh, might come close to replicating Toby's experience. But when I unexpectedly had surgery a uh, few days ago and Judge Brower ever so cautiously suggested that we should have a backup plan, I told him that if Toby could go it alone, so could he. <laughs> I would have too. We know. <laughs> you, you might still do it. You've heard about the runaway arbitrator, haven't you? Um, uh, as a longtime chair of the ITA and as also Ameri the American lawyer's reigning king of international arbitrators, Judge Brower doesn't need uh, too much of an introduction. Adding a little bit to what Andrea has already said, over the course of 50 years, he has sat as arbitrator in over in scores of investment treaty cases. He has pleaded before the International Court of Justice and the UN Compensation Commission. He served on the benches of the Iran-US Claims Tribunal and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. 
He has written or edited five books, one of which received the ASIL Certificate of Merit, and he's published more than 100 articles. Now, reading the first paragraph of your CV, very long CV, uh, one is struck by the juxtaposition of two different figures. On the one hand, there's the reference to the 50-year duration of your legal career, and also the 30 years that you have concentrated on public international law and international dispute settlement, all of which suggests that you were a late bloomer, uh, that you may never have been a young arbitrator. True. Um, did you even take more than a single course in international law when you were at Harvard Law School? I did take a single course. You did? Yes. I asked if you had taken more than a single course. No. <laughs> Why not? Well, at that point, I was uh, planning to uh, join the uh, United States Foreign Service. Um, I was persuaded that it wouldn't be bad if I went to law school and have a uh, degree either in law, in that case, or a PhD. So when it didn't work out at the State Department, I might um, have an alternative uh, profession. And so I took all the things that you need to take to be effective in a law firm. So I took evidence, I took antitrust, I took securities law. We were forced to take commercial law, all these horrible, boring uh, things. I figured I needed a toolkit to practice uh, as a lawyer. And I thought, you know, there's Baxter and Sohn. I never studied with either one of them. Later, each of them was counselor on international law to the legal advisor, and I worked with them at the um, State Department, so it was late, uh, a late education. But I figured, if I'm going for an interview at law firms, and it says I studied United Nations law with Louis B. Sohn, they're going to think I'm some kind of a weirdo. I don't really want to practice law. So, so tell us about the early years of your career at White and Case, okay. perhaps focusing uh, on experiences that had nothing to do with international law or international dispute right. settlement, but that might have prepared you to become even more effective uh, in this field. Well, I've sometimes said before I went to the State Department, I was a real lawyer uh, in New York. I became a partner in the firm on the basis of being a commercial litigator, trial lawyer. I tried jury cases. I uh, tried, obviously, non-jury cases. I had appeals. I did a tremendous amount of criminal defense uh, work, including front page cases of the, the then biggest securities fraud artist in history to that time, and also a um, black American yeoman first class, 17 years service, uh, who, uh, before we got into the case, had been convicted for espionage, uh, conspiracy to commit espionage for the Soviet Union. I handled um, all of the exploding beer bottle cases in the New York metropolitan area mm -hmm. for uh, Budweiser and uh, F and M Schaefer. Uh, I was asked to defend all of the defamation cases brought against Dun and Bradstreet. This is before federal credit reporting restrictions. Uh, also McGraw Hill, um, and uh, I used to say I did the five percent of litigation things that would come through a law big law firm uh, that no one in their right mind wanted to handle because that didn't lead to partnership, like big securities cases and so on and so forth. But I guess when it came time, somebody looked around and said, you know, who's actually been in court and done something? And uh, it, was, it, it was a great training. And I think that later on, when I did get into international uh, arbitration, people of my generation uh, and Doke's not my generation, but, you know, <clears throat> he's working on it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the fact that you knew how to cross-examine, you knew how to try a case, you knew the basics. There were too, too many uh, people, I think, uh, now, since it's such a big field and who do only international arbitration, um, you know, haven't, haven't been out to the woodshed of real law practice and cross-examination in particular. One of That's your, the short version. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one, of, one of your mentors, uh, David Abshire, right. uh, introduced you to the concept of uh, building blocks, mm -hmm. the idea that every career step should represent a building block to right. the place that you really long to be professionally. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the building blocks that enabled you to make the transition uh, from a litigation practice to international practice? Well, 
um, the four years I spent at the State Department, uh, I've always regarded as the, in a sense, the real beginning of my life or the beginning of my real professional uh, life, because that's where I really learned a lot of international law. Also uh, learned, relearned constitutional law and to some extent administrative uh, law. But when I came <clears throat> out of the uh, State Department, uh, eventually, the, I think it was the combination of uh, that experience, mm -hmm. uh, a certain profile, uh, I guess I had acquired at that point, at least within some circles, the combination of serious litigation experience and serious international law uh, experience was, uh, to me, that really laid the basis for international arbitration. Sticking with some of your experiences at the State Department, um, can you describe some of the things that really provided a great foundation for exceptional success in arbitration, as an advocate in particular? Right. Well, I've, um, I've often said the best training I experience I had ever in advocacy uh, really uh, began at the State Department and to some extent con uh, continued then at the uh, White House. If you're, as it was in my case, deputy legal advisor or acting legal advisor of the State Department, uh, there's a policy issue that comes up that pits you against assistant secretary in charge of one of the substantive uh, bureaus. It's the secretary of state who, who's going to have to decide what do we do because you have potentially two conflicting policies. Uh, you can imagine how much time <clears throat> you and the uh, other assistant secretary have to plead your case to the secretary of state. If you can't be convincing in three minutes, forget it. So, so when and how did you finally become involved in international arbitration? Well, I'd like to say it was through determination, but um, it's always getting the first case. Uh, when I left the State Department, one of my uh, uh, colleagues there had become general counsel of New England Petroleum Corporation, owned by um, Ed Carey, the brother of um, then or later governor of New York, Hugh Carey. And um, they thought they had a potential arbitration against British Petroleum. So I spent two weeks in uh, London uh, working on that. And uh, I realized uh, we needed actually uh, English uh, counsel. And my partner who had been in charge of our London office recommended to me Sir Edward Singleton, who had recently uh, left his post as um, President of the Law Society of England and Wales and was back at McFarland's as a uh, consultant. So we worked together. Unfortunately, I had to inform the client it had no case to make. But it was an interesting two weeks in London. And uh, <clears throat> later, um, it was maybe a year later, two years later, I was called by Tim Singleton <clears throat> and said, uh, I've got this case for my Swedish client, uh, Skanska, or you've seen it, Skanska Cement Group, which is the biggest construction company operating in New York, I think, currently, <clears throat> against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was a subcontractor to uh, Lockheed, and Saudi Arabia wasn't paying anybody because they couldn't figure out internally how much Adnan Khashoggi was supposed to get out of this deal. Um, so in any event, that was an ICC uh, arbitration, and uh, off I went. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, as soon as we got a few preliminary issues resolved, the other side caved, uh, Lockheed uh, settled for what my client would have accepted in the first place. So, um, yeah, I figured, okay, now I'm an expert. And uh, go how, how old were you at the time? Oh, oh well, gosh, 45? Yeah. yeah, I was... Uh, yeah, I'm, I, late bloomer, as you say. But of course, the field of international arbitration was a late bloomer as well on my time scale. So oh, it, it, it might be reassuring for those of us who are now in our mid-40s to know that my father um, started his tremendous career at that age. Right. However, another thing that we have to keep in mind, and this is more devastating for those of us who uh, like to uh, keep up with him, 
within four years, within four years of starting your first arbitration, right. uh, you became a full-time judge on right. the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. How did, how did that happen? Politics. Okay? Uh, look, uh, I used to be a politician uh, when I was a lot younger than you, and I was elected to, uh, to office uh, in New Jersey. <clears throat> and I really had contemplated a, a career in elective uh, politics. But I got spoiled by being at the uh, State Department. I got to the State Department in part because I was, I have to say, I'm talking about the period up to about 2000. Keep that in mind. I was a uh, certified registered uh, Republican, Republican office holder. Uh, I had uh, seriously good, uh, <clears throat> we used to say liberal Republican credentials mm -hmm. uh, from New Jersey. <clears throat> Um, and uh, there were moderates, and there were liberals, and then there were other people. Uh, <laughs> and we, <laughs> so uh, frankly, that all helped clear the way for me to be hired. Uh, initially, as assistant legal advisor, I resigned from the White and Case four months after becoming a partner to take on that job. And I, Said, well, I don't know why he wants to go to Washington. If they asked him to be Secretary of State, that would that might make sense. But anyway, that's um, so. In the State Department, of course, I got to work with a lot of people in different departments and in the White House and different places. And um, so, when um, President Reagan uh, was elected. Um, there's a long story about why uh, I did not wind up in the State Department at that time. Um, and uh, I was gunning for this job. Um, and by the time that happened, everybody in a position of authority in Washington to check it off and say, right, Brower, they, they were rooting for me. And I got it. But without politics and the people I met through politics and through being in Washington, I'd just be another guy out there somewhere plotting his path. Um, you've witnessed a uh, great period of change uh, during myself, your time in, of in no, international arbitration. Oh, okay. No, I wasn't talking about the Republican <laughs> thing. Um, but uh, in the field, you've witnessed a great period of change. So 15 years ago, right. a very popular book, Dealing in Virtue, described the rise of an elite core of arbitrators known for their professional reputation and integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, however, there's been a volume that portrays many of the people, including you, in a very different light. Of course, I'm talking about profiting from injustice. Oh, yes. uh, how did we get from dealing in virtue to profiting from injustice? Yeah, but I'm, so, I'm sorry, I was only number two on the list of the 15 most wanted people uh -huh. uh, in international arbitration on that. but. You know, we don't always get to the absolute top. The, um, <laughs> the problem is bilateral investment treaties and NAFTA. Uh, basically, even the United States, in a sense, did not know what it was signing uh, because, oh my God, you mean this isn't all about Mexico? The United States can be a, a, a respondent in a case. Canada can be a, uh, a respondent. <clears throat> And then you get this phenomenon <clears throat> um, at the risk of um, treading on a few toes. The opposition to the system, the, the, the non-governmental organizations that say this is all unjust and I and others are profiting from injustice, uh, it's a, um, in Europe you would say it's a leftish um, group of people. Um, let's talk about the environmental movement for an example, which I do not regard as leftish uh, necessarily. Uh, they're good people. But they rail against, uh, I'm, I'm going to pick up where Yagosh left off uh, th this morning. <clears throat> they rail against the fact that the policy space of sovereigns is limited by these treaties. They're prevented from being able to do things that they want to do. And the Center for International Environmental Law in Washington, used to be run by our friend Dan uh, McGraw, uh -huh. has uh, the present director has publicly testified before Congress against the whole system of, uh, invest of um, 
international arbitration and investment, investment investor state uh, uh, disputes. However, the very same people support limitations of sovereignty and fight for the adoption, for the ratification of treaties which limit states' policy space to the extent of prohibiting the use uh, of certain substances. So it's really, it's a question of <clears throat> what you're fighting for substantively and uh, basically it's being, it's being hypocritical. Um, but there are an awful lot of people mostly not really well informed, not understanding, and really not understanding the overall problems of, of governance and, and international investment and uh, politics. You've also been a uh, critic in the field. You've criticized right. the profession for what you call rampant inventiveness. Mm. What do you mean? Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Having just given a lecture in November called the Alexander Lecture, which invented the term investomercial arbitration, I suppose I'm, now I've got to defend myself. The, um, it's very simple. <coughs> This is a competitive field, international arbitration at all levels. Firms, lawyers compete to get the clients. They compete to keep the clients. Uh, they compete against each uh, other um, in the arbitrations. Uh, they want to be number one, two, three, whatever on the list of biggest uh, arbitration practices. Arbitrators are very quietly competitive not because they're going out and doing battle with each other, but we're in, I often say, this is the most democratic system in the world because as we sit here, every minute of every hour of every day, international arbitrators uh, are subject to election. S out there somewhere, somebody is thinking, who should I appoint? And we don't get appointed for terms, we get appointed for, uh, we get appointed for a case. So, and arbitral institutions are competing with each other like mad. And it's a question of money, too. So what do you expect? How do you profile yourself as an institution or as an individual? Oh, you come up with a really smart idea that gets a headline, like, uh, let's do away with party appointments. Uh, or <clears throat> just to mention one. Uh, or let's, let's never have dissenting opinions in international arbitration, or let's do this, or let's do that. So the regulations and, and the, the protocols of arbitral organizations proliferate, uh, and you read you know, things like I've just mentioned. Um, and by the time I publish uh, an article with a, uh, a colleague of mine entitled The Two-Headed Nightingale, <clears throat> why certain people's mistrust of uh, party appointments and so on and so forth is wrong-headed, you know, that's, that's not so much news. O only, only your best friends uh, read it. In the meantime, somebody else is popping off with another, quote, great idea that will revolutionize the profession, most of which sink to the bottom of the sea of their own weight, even without being given a push. And I spend a lot of time giving pushes. In um, put in slightly different terms, I think one of the things that you're arguing for is to stick with the classical model of international right. arbitration, to right. stick with the Model T. Um, right. for, for you, what is the Model T of international arbitration, the classical model that we shouldn't be tinkering with? That <clears throat> it's possessed by the parties. Mm -hmm. They make the choices of who they want to judge their case under what rules or limitations. Um, and they, they, they own the creation of it. <coughs> That's like having children, excuse me. <coughs> you create this thing and pretty soon it's way beyond your reach. Uh, uh, but they've created it, it's their child, they believe in it. Uh, and tinkering with the basics of it is is, is just a loser. It's as uh, Stephen uh, Jagosh was saying at lunch, you know, when you, I've sat down <clears throat> last July 
uh, I was invited to speak to a very close group of uh, in-house counsel for major German corporations about this uh, subject. And even I was surprised uh, to some degree at the extent of pessimism about what the system really produces in terms of, of, of what you need. If you depend on, for example, for your case, uh, on um, application of a most favored nation uh, clause to get you to the dispute settlement provision of another uh, treaty, it's a crapshoot. You, you, it's a crapshoot uh, because you know, certain people are known to feel this way and that way, and you know you might not wind up with the people you want. So coming back to the Alexander lecture that you just mentioned, yeah. uh, you just uh, gave a lecture to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in which you described investomercial arbitration as an emerging, distinct, hybrid mm -hmm. species of international arbitration. Uh, what do you mean, and does this truly reflect the, the good or the bad inventiveness in arbitration? Ah, well, I admit to inventing a term, uh, but I didn't invent any new thing other than a term. It was simply an effort to uh, refocus <clears throat> people away from thinking there's commercial arbitration and there's investment dispute arbitration. The real distinction, and I've called this investomercial arbitration, is arbitration involving a private party on one side and a sovereign on the other. And there's not much difference uh, between doing that under ICC rules and under a, a treaty, because if you look at the cases and you go through the last now 60 years of history <clears throat> of non-treaty based international uh, disputes between an investor and a, and a host state, they have basically been made by one means or another to involve application of international law in addition to whatever local law or national law is necessary. And by the same token, treaty disputes, which of course raise treaty uh, questions, also inevitably will get you into issues of some national law, uh, whether it's because that's the law of the contract that gave rise to the problem or through a broad arbitration clause, which includes disputes other uh, than violations of the treaty, uh, which treaty gives rise to the tribunal, uh, or through um, an umbrella clause. You know, it's six of one and a half a dozen of the uh, other. So there's what I call investomercial arbitration on the one hand, and then arbitration involving only private parties on the other hand. That's the real distinction. And uh, having this debate that Global Arbitration Review had that some of you may be involved in are, are these in investment treaty arbitration and commercial arbitration, are they like apples and oranges? Or if you examine scientifically, apples and oranges are practically, practically the same. It's true. <laughs> NASA well, did a study on it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. You'll see when you read the lecture. Well, whether we're talking about apples, oranges, or uh, perhaps bananas, um, how, do you how do you assess the health of uh, investment treaty arbitration? Because on the one hand, in 2012, we had the largest number of new cases actually filed. It, up to that point, it was 58. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also a year that marked a dramatic 18% decline in uh, worldwide cross-border investment. So what do these numbers suggest about the security and predictability of investment treaties? <clears throat> well, it's um, the present situation is a pale version of what's going on on Maidan Square in Ukraine. Um, there's a lot of attack uh, on the system uh, and um, if anybody happens to pick up in the spring issue number three of this year's Columbia Journal on um, the trans, um, transnational transnational law. law, right, okay. You'll see a long article by myself and a, uh, and, and a uh, colleague uh, mounting a comprehensive defense of the, uh, uh, of the system uh, in general. But it certainly is under attack. 
um, and we'll see what happens. Uh, Mark Cantor has uh, been very uh, clear in expressing at various meetings that if the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and the EU-United States agreements actually materialize, whatever they provide with respect to uh, international arbitration w will, in a sense, uh, make the model for 70 percent uh, of the world's gross domestic uh, uh, gross product. Um, so those should be watched carefully. Um, and I don't think the drop in international investment has anything to do with the status of the system. That's just a lack of confidence <clears throat> um, and uh, despite the system and, uh, of course, the overall world economic situation. Turning from the state of practice to your legacy, um, I'd always experienced... You're my legacy. I had always experienced <laughs> you as a... <laughs> I had always experienced you as a consummate diplomat um, who, who typically cautions uh, at least other people against the use of adjectives in making legal arguments. Uh, but a profile in GAR describes you as, quote, a controversial figure known for outspokenness in deliberations and recently inclined, inclined towards, quote, scathing dissents. Uh, did, did I miss something, or are you a true Gemini? <laughs> well, I, I am a Gemini, and um, I'm happy being a Gemini. Uh -huh. I think it's the best thing that can happen uh, to one that allows you to play all kinds of roles. The um, what is described as a scathing dissent, actually, I was having a conversation with uh, Alan Moore over drink the other uh, evening about my dissenting opinion in the uh, Daimler Chrysler case uh, versus uh, Argentina, um, or maybe it was uh, Larry. Somebody uh, said, God, I, you, you, you must have been very angry. Well, I don't think I expressed myself in angry words, but <clears throat> I think the facts can scathe if the, the argument, the, the factual, uh, the buildup of the legal uh, argument is just plain unsound and you point it out, uh, then that's a scathing uh, dissent. In that particular uh, case... Yeah, let, let's, let's focus on well, that case. for and, and for people who don't know, uh, this was a case in which the tribunal decided that the claimant could not use an MFN right. provision right. to avoid an 18-month domestic litigation requirement right. in Argentina. Um, and among other things, just so that everybody has the words, you describe the tribunal's reasoning as profoundly wrong. Right. You criticized, quote, the quality of the arguments. Right. And you expressed the hope that your dissent would dispel for others, for others, the award substantial confusion and correct the numerous errors that permeate the award's understanding of the MFN mechanism. Not so particularly your, so intense your, language. What's your question? <laughs> uh, well, many people regard that as particularly intense language. I and I was wondering uh, if there was something, whether uh, case-specific or simply the growing divisiveness of the issue of uh, the MFN clause uh, that triggered the intensity mm. of uh, that right. expression. Well, one of my uh, pet peeves is uh, improper application of Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention on interpretation of, um, of treaties. Now, uh, in that case, and this was a, a similar mistake was made in the, in the Plama uh, case, um, uh, Pierre-Marie Dupuis, a mm -hmm. very distinguished European uh, international lawyer, insisted that if you are going to uh, interpret an MFN clause as permitting you to gain access to the dispute settlement provision of another treaty, there must be, quote, affirmative evidence. Affirmative evidence. The Vienna Convention doesn't talk about evidence, let alone affirmative evidence. It says you look at the text. Uh, it, it's the natural meaning in context. It divides context. It's not loaded 
one way or the other, and it shouldn't be loaded. loaded. But the only way he and uh, another colleague could get to that result was you have to have affirmative evidence, and we don't see affirmative evidence. I thought that was so wrong. And yes, I wanted to spell it out, not only to uh, explain to the people who appointed me that I wasn't asleep at the switch. That happens sometimes. And not that I'm asleep at the switch, but sometimes you, <laughs> you write. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you, only he knows for sure. The, uh, sometimes you, you, you have to write partly for that purpose. But also, since these are all, all uh, published, and I feel very strongly about properly applying the Vienna uh, Convention, which is not always done, um, I thought I need to put it out there, and hopefully other people will be able to make use of it uh, in other cases. Have dissents, in fact, been effective in clarifying the scope, particularly of things like the MFN provision? Well, there's still, uh, uh, obviously, there's still a dispute, because people who don't think like I do, as I do, about those uh, things seem to think they are right. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is the principal uh, defect or principal problem of the whole framework mm -hmm. we're dealing with. Um, it's, um, in a, it's inevitable. Oh, should users be satisfied with these consistently inconsistent results? At of least course on not. Of course not. Of course not. Unless it goes their way. Unless they win. No, that's the real problem. So I, I know you feel very strongly about the, uh, your expression of your opinion in the Daimler case, but looking back through your career, right. what is the one decision that you would most like to have your name associated with? Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, let me put it this way. I th think from the from the um, memorials uh, that I read and the submissions that are made uh, to tribunals of which I'm a member and the things I read, actually, it seems to be the one most in play, the most used, the most referred to, is my separate opinion in Amico International Finance uh, at the Iran-United States Claims Tribunal back in 19. Uh, 87, uh, because both the award and my uh, separate opinion were seem to have been sort of landmark uh, statements with respect to the law of expropriation. So I, since 1987, I don't seem to have done anything better. <laughs> um, your father once wrote. Uh, your grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather. Right. Uh, once wrote that no one succeeds, no one succeeds, unless a lot of other people want that person to succeed. Right. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the contributions that mentors, friends, and uh, communities have, have made to your professional development. Well, there, there's sort of two different uh, uh, things here. I've had basically, uh, I often refer to four people of, as having been most influential on me. Uh, one was your, your grandfather, who was uh, a great man, a great figure in his field, and a very wise person. And for some stupid reason, as a young person, I always followed his advice. I was not rebelling. I found other ways to rebel, but that was not, not by not taking his advice. Another was Jack Stevenson, uh, later presiding partner of Solomon Cromwell, who was legal advisor at the State Department with whom I worked, we just, you know, hit it off uh, beautifully. And he did many things to uh, advance my career. You've mentioned before Dave Apshire. I didn't know him from a hole in the wall until he showed up the State Department as Assistant Secretary of State for Congressional Relations. And he had wonderful uh, network all over uh, town. And he still does. He must be about 90 uh, by, uh, by now. Uh, if it weren't for him, uh, I wouldn't have been invited to uh, be part of the President Ford political strategy team at the 1976 convention, which was a big fight between Ford and uh, Reagan for the nomination. Last national convention in which the candidate was decided at the convention. 
that's a long time ago. If it weren't for him, uh, I would have been invited to the White House to be his uh, uh, deputy. He is a cabinet rank special counsel to President Reagan, trying to dig him out uh, politically of the Iran-Contra problem. <coughs> uh, so he had a great uh, um, influence. And another was somebody nobody ever heard of except you, and that's George Jager, who was uh, one of my tutors in the honors program at, at uh, Harvard College many uh, years ago. <coughs> uh, your grandfather was right. Uh, you cannot really succeed unless an awful lot of people want you to succeed and, and support you and, and favor you in uh, some way. That puts a, um, uh, a great emphasis on leadership uh, and dealing correctly uh, with uh, people. If you can't inspire uh, other people who necessarily will be in a position to, to help you and support you, um, you know, you're not going to go anywhere. Uh, and it's very satisfying to me, obviously, that I now, <clears throat> by now, have a sort of a family of former <laughs> law clerks and a lot of people out there who seem <clears throat> to, uh, to want me to succeed. Even at um, 78 years old, you keep a pace that uh, makes. Who's 78 around here? Uh, that okay. makes uh, that uh, really holds. This is uh, a hypothetical. Most of us in awe. <laughs> um, what are the secrets to longevity uh, at the top? I mean, so we've talked about how you got there, but what are some of the secrets to longevity at the top of a really competitive field? Right. <clears throat> Well, uh, people have to think that, that you're um, honest, um, knowledgeable in the field, intelligent, that you make good decisions, that you have uh, good judgment, and that you're, you're not prejudiced in any way, one way or the other. You're only prejudiced is in favor of the law and to apply the law uh, to the facts. And it is a, uh, it, it just, as I say, we're up for election um, every second. Um, and people keep, I maybe you should ask all these people who keep appointing me uh, what, 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 why it is uh, that they do it. I might, I might learn something. Uh, but I think I've always... You can come to the mic when we're done. Right, right. I've, I've said, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm frequently asked by various people about different arbitrators and what do you think about this person. And uh, often, and I think this is one reason uh, that the uh, average age of uh, a certain group of arbitrators is so high, uh, because I will say of people, look, this person has achieved so much. He, she has nothing to lose but his or her reputation. And to us, reputation is everything. That's just the way we live. Now, to round out the picture, uh, I, we should discuss a few honors that reflect the insights of people who have observed you at close range. <laughs> Uh, oftentimes in life, naming of one sort or another represents a particular honor. So there's Brower Commons at Rutgers University, named for your father. Mm -hmm. Brower Hall within Tiller House, the headquarters of the American Society, named for you. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most unusual professional <laughs> honor that has ever been bestowed on you? Uh, the name of it is Bari Lipa Browerai, and for those biologists or entomologists of you, it is um, a rare insect found in the uh, Guanacaste province of uh, Costa Rica. Uh, when I uh, represented Costa Rica for a number of years in practice, and uh, notably in the Santa Elena arbitration uh, at uh, ICSID, 
I worked very closely with a, uh, an American uh, professor of biology who mostly lives in uh, uh, Costa Rica and really is the genius behind conservation there and has won every Nobel type prize in the world for uh, uh, conservation. So <clears throat> we did a good job on the case. It was a good result for Costa Rica. And he said, well, I will see to it that we name a newly discovered species after you. You were uh, thinking of something particularly, a, a, a mink, a fox? <laughs> <laughs> Not from Costa Rica, yeah. <laughs> but uh, an agouti, uh, perhaps. But um, Daniel Jansen, the gentleman in question, has also a terrific sense of humor. So he named <clears throat> uh, uh, this uh, after uh, me. It is, as he pointed out, a parasitic wasp. <laughs> uh, but, but he did start with the adjective elegant. Yes. And oh, yeah. Elegant and pinstriped. Oh, well, yes. Well, that was the other thing that, that, that uh, I mean, he, he, <laughs> he has a thing about lawyers. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, I'm a wasp. Uh, <clears throat> but the other thing was that the, um, in the caterpillar form, uh, before it becomes uh, a parasitic wasp, he said, it also, it's dressed like a lawyer. It's in a striped suit, <laughs> yellow with black stripes uh, uh, around. And, uh, you know, I've always treasured that uh, very much. And if you get the right volume of the you know, the scientific publications in this, they've got, uh, it's all spelled out there. Yeah. I including the part that it lays its eggs in its host, which is then devoured. Which, which is, is devoured. That's right. Yep. Parasitic. Things mm -hmm. probably said more, uh, said more than anything about um, your litigation strategy. Thank at that you. Stage. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, when you graduated from high school, yes. this is what your um, colleagues, how your colleagues described you. And this is something that my father uh, absolutely had nothing to do with. He was nowhere near the yearbook staff. Uh, but it, they wrote, the will to win, will win, genius for organization, savoir-faire, ideals, and common sense, enviable willpower, has his thumb in many pies. So ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Please join me in thanking Judge Brower for <laughs> hearing his remarks. Thank you. If there are questions, either on arbitration or the judge's long career in it, I'm not sure if we have a microphone set up, but there is a podium, and anybody is welcome um, to ask. Yes? Just speaking for myself, may I thank the Corral of Twins for this very <laughs> enjoyable display. And <laughs> the question I have for the one in the bright colored tie is you've indicated what makes a good advocate. You've indicated that you're not so keen on the overuse of adverbs. But there's a lot of counsel in the room, and I'm wondering if you could share with us two or three of your pet hates from an advocacy point of view. <clears throat> well, uh, these uh, are not strictly my pet hates. I can just tell you from uh, a number of years now sitting with a lot of uh, other arbitrators, uh, some of them American, of course, but uh, predominantly other nationalities uh, and not always uh, native English speaking nationalities. Nobody, but nobody is favorably affected by bickering uh, and pot shots of uh, counsel uh, at each other uh, and their uh, clients. And of course, um, American lawyers get a very bad name historically uh, in, in this uh, because of uh, what uh, many think is the uh, tradition of litigators and trial lawyers uh, in, the, in, in the United States. And I remember um, Swiss a friend of mine, Pierre-Yves Chance, who's been practicing in uh, Geneva for years, spent some time at White and Case. Um, and he was convinced uh, that uh, White and Case 
had great opportunities in international uh, arbitration because it combined both the ability of American lawyers to just process a lot of paper, do a lot of work, get things uh, together uh, with an understanding of why, uh, let's say, three European professors sitting as arbitrators uh, needed to be approached in a, in a certain way uh, and not the way that we uh, might do it in the uh, United States District Court for the Southern District of of New York. I think that's the, that, that's certainly uh, um, something that bo that bothers everybody. I don't care who they are. They just don't uh, like it. Valued, of course, is being straightforward and honest about your case. And the uh, British uh, barristers have a, have a wonderful uh, phrase. If they're uh, uh, putting forth a couple of points <clears throat> and they, they put a point forward, which is kind of a loser, uh, and, and the judge calls them on to say, uh, yes, my lord, but that would not be my primary submission. You need to put your best uh, case, but uh, don't, don't, uh, don't exaggerate. I think as, my, uh, as your grandfather uh, said, among many things, uh, in this respect, too, honesty is not only the best policy, is not just the best policy, it's the only policy. Yes, sir. It's time, I were, is it, time is being called? It is time to, to break. Uh, but since I have the microphone, I have to add one comment, and that is that uh, on behalf of the Institute for Transnational Arbitration, we have been blessed by a, a, a great many leaders in this field, but none has contributed more to the ITA than Charles Brower, and um, Chip has been right there behind as leader of our academic council. We really appreciate you being here, both of you today, to do this. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>